Uh, let's give uh, Carl a warm welcome and uh, take it away. Thank you. I was just saying I'm very excited to be giving a talk in front of a live audience. It's been years since pre-COVID since I've actually been able to see the people who I'm trying to talk to. And uh, uh, thank you for being here. I'm going to talk about uh, a little side project I did called uh, Perfect Physics. Uh, the project I found was interesting. I learned some things about Python and, and libraries. I learned some things about physics. And I might have even learned some things about uh, philosophy. The, an early version of this project led to a 100 comment thread on physics uh, Reddit that was then banned for being too controversial. And we'll talk about how that turned out, uh, too. So this all starts in 2015. Just generally interested in physics, I thought I'd do a project uh, using the Cinema 4D uh, modeling engine, 3D modeling engine. I wanted to do billiards. And the idea was the cue ball would hit the object balls. They'd separate. And then using what I think was a little Python script within Cinema 4D, I would reverse the direction of the balls. They would come together, reform the triangle, and shoot out the cue ball. And if physics is reversible, which I thought it was, then I hoped that the cue balls, uh, the object balls would just form a stationary triangle, and the cue ball would come out at exactly the same speed uh, that it went in. So I uh, tried this. Here's the. Uh, Here's the video of what happened. So we have our object balls. Cue ball comes in. It hits. They scatter. We use a little script to reverse the velocity of all the balls. They come back in. The cue ball shoots out. Everything's great, except there's still some energy in the balls. And uh, it wasn't reversible. We can see this again uh, from a different angle. So does anybody have any ideas what went wrong? Uh, my theory was that it was a problem with precision, that there were two problems. Specifically with precision, one, uh, collisions are detected on each uh, frame of the video. And so the exact position and time of the collision isn't known. And also, of course, I was using floating point numbers. I presumed it was using floating point numbers for all the uh, 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 measurements. And that, that would cause things to get worse and worse over time. Uh, the rest of this talk, we'll see that I looked at that, which we could call the precision butterfly effect, and then found out that, uh, and then tested the hypothesis that that was the problem using the uh, SymPy library with uh, Python. Um, we'll see that that doesn't, didn't completely solve the problem. And then in the end, to uh, quote Shakespeare, uh, to misquote Shakespeare, that the fault might not lie uh, in ourselves or in our code, but with our philosophy, that there might actually be something about physics that's uh, thwarting us here. So going back to the hypothesis that it's a, a, a measurement problem, suppose the two balls, we have two balls and they're here, uh, and uh, we move forward one frame. They might be overlapping now. Exactly where we detect that overlap and collision can change the angle between the two balls. And then we could imagine that that would, and that actually will, change the angle that the uh, ball uh, shoots out. Uh, another thing here is the red ball, the ball that was originally moving, was at minus 0.666666 when we started. After this collision, it's at minus 33333, not three or four. But at seven, just in the course of the collision, we've lost uh, one digit uh, of, of precision. And the butterfly effect is the idea that small differences can have big consequences as time goes forward. And it's a 
perfectly reasonable explanation for what the, what the problem was. So to test this, I wanted to do two things. The first was instead of finding the next collision by uh, frame, why don't we, I mean, these are just moving circles. Why don't we figure out exactly when they're going to collide? Um, we can do that in uh, Python with NumPy by setting up some initial conditions, uh, the position and velocity of the, uh, of the circles and their, and their radiuses. And then we can create a function that says the future x position of the first ball, ball A, is just the time times its velocity in the x uh, axis plus its current x coordinate so on for the y coordinate, so on for the uh, second uh, circle, the b circle. Um, we need one more thing. How do we know when two circles are touching? Uh, in my case, the two circles have radius 1, so they're touching when their centers are exactly two apart. In general, two circles touch when their centers are the distance that's the sum of their uh, uh, radiuses uh, apart. And we can put this in an uh, IPython notebook with uh, some interactivity, whoop, with some interactivity, and actually put on a slider to change the time, uh, just to get an idea of what's going on. If we do that, if we move backwards, they'll actually get uh, farther apart. If we move it forward, they get closer. Whoops, too far. Move back a little bit. We can uh, see somewhere around 0 0.4, 0 0.5, they're colliding. Um, so that's better than before. We're, if we're not, we have more precision for the collision uh, than we had before. But it's not the, the exact time of the collision. We still have this problem with the uh, decimals. So the. Um, idea next was I said, well, let's see if we can get this to be exact. And for that, I used uh, SymPy. SymPy is a Python library for computer algebra. If you're familiar with Mathematica or Maple, it's similar, except it's free, and it works with Python. Works very nicely inside Python. So we can set up the same kind of things we had on the previous slide that were numeric, and uh, we can make them uh, we can uh, do them symbolically and get an exact answer for when, for example, the uh, two circles uh, collide. Uh, the way you use SymPy is first you define what your SymPy symbols were gonna are, and that way they don't uh, get confused with the Python variables. And then you set up equations. The first four equations you see on the slide are just talking about how circles move. And then the fifth equation, uh, is the thing that says we want the distance between the centers to be equal to the uh, sum of the radiuses, and that'll tell us that the two circles are touching exactly. And with SymPy, there's a function called uh, non-lin solve, because our fifth equation here is a nonlinear equation, and we just give it our equations, and we tell it the variables that we want it to solve for, time, and the four uh, numbers about the future position. And it takes, I forgot how long this takes, just a few seconds, I think. Uh, and it gives us a formula. And we can uh, find the formula for the time of the, of, of the collisions. Um, that's this, uh, does that show up? That's this big expression uh, on the right. Um, so it's so long it doesn't even fit on the slide. But that's OK, the computer can evaluate it. One thing that might have it surprised me a little bit when I did this, it actually comes up with two solutions for when the circles will collide. Any volunteers about why there's two solutions? Any guesses? Is that What's that? The root term. Root. Non-linear equation, so there are two roots in the Oh, right. I mean, that's, that's mathematically why there's two uh, collision, or two times where they touch. Um, does anyone have any idea physically why there's two solutions? Exactly. 
So uh, the two balls uh, will pass through each other, and that's why there's two solutions. And in fact, uh, if the balls are moving away from each other, you'll get a negative time. It'll say, oh, just go back in time. And they collided twice because of the, uh, because of the, the, the roots that you pointed out. If the two balls are um, moving in some weird way that they never collide, parallel, but there's some other things they could do, either forward or backwards in time, you'll get a complex uh, solution. Um, I found that fascinating, that when I actually looked at the equations, uh, what was going on with the math, corresponded to different interpretations uh, uh, of the physics. So the solution I found on the previous page is for any two circles of any radiuses moving at any speeds. But in our particular case, we have initial conditions that give us these two circles moving at these speeds at these positions. Uh, we can put them in, and we get the two solutions, uh, 13 sixths plus or minus uh, uh, square root of 3. That second one is the point, approximately 0.43 that we saw when we were um, uh, sliding around. So that's uh, good that we've got an exact answer that corresponds to what the numeric solution uh, uh, told us we would. Um, this is showing the two solutions, the two balls uh, uh, first hitting each other. And then some people call this tunneling, tunneling through each other and touching on the other side. So uh, to make this simulator work, we need two equation solutions. The first one is to tell us when they're going to meet next. The next one is to tell us when two circles hit, how does that collision um, change their velocity? And we can set up uh, equations following the same pattern that we did before. So um, we're going to assume perfect elastic collisions here. And the first equation just says uh, EQ1 that the energy before and the energy after is equal. This looks like three things, but it's really just one equation, just written in on three lines. Um, another equation about collisions, uh, perfectly elastic collisions, is that momentum is conserved. And momentum, uh, like velocity, has an x and y coordinate in this two-dimensional case. So we'll say that the momentum in the x dimension is conserved, and momentum in the uh, y um, uh, on the y axis is conserved. So that gives us uh, three equations. We have four unknowns. We want to know the velocity, the x and y velocity of both objects after the collision. And so we're one equation short. The final equation doesn't have a real name that I've found, but when circles collide, um, at the angle 90 degrees from their collision, they won't speed up or slow down. So I'm calling that conservation of glancing velocity. And it's specific to collisions between perfect circles. Um, and that's all equation uh, uh, 4 says, that that uh, glancing velocity will, will stay the same. And now we can put these equations into SimPy. It runs a little bit longer to come up with an answer. Um, but it'll give us uh, uh, equations telling us how, to, uh, how the velocity changes afterwards. So with these two um, formulas, when is the next collision and how does that collision change the velocity, we can create uh, a, 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 an engine. So the first thing we'll do is between all pairs of objects, we'll find the exact time to the next uh, collision. In the topmost picture, only one ball is moving. So it'll be the time for that leftmost ball to hit the second uh, ball. Um, then, uh, then we'll move forward whatever that amount of time is. It's, uh, in this case, uh, three uh, seconds or so. We'll move all the objects forward exactly that amount. And by exactly, I mean we're going to keep things in, uh, in terms of formulas and expressions with square roots and and rational numbers with divides. We're not going to do anything uh, in floating point. Uh, when we move all the objects forward, we're going to have at least one collision, but we might have more than one collision. In that case, and we'll come back to this, we're going to pick one of the colliding pairs and adjust its velocities exactly, and then we'll just loop. And the next collision that we've, we'll find the time to the next collision, that time might be zero, and we'll just uh, uh, keep repeating. So, yeah. Please. Uh, so I was wondering the, uh, if you analyze the system of equations, then something happens to the algebraic degree of the positions in the logic in terms of the starting position. Have you analyzed how this increases with number of collisions? 
Yes, we'll be talking about We'll be talking a lot about what happens when you get more and more collisions. It's a, it's a problem. <laughs> so, uh, I don't want to think about that yet. Uh, sorry, I'll wait. <laughs> Thank you for asking, though. Um, so these formulas are enough to get us Newton's cradle. If you remember Newton's cradle, we've got some balls. We take one out. We expect it to transfer all its energy th through the stack and then come out to the other uh, side. Whoops. Oh, this isn't mic'd. It's too bad. <laughs> Um, so it does the right thing here. Uh, you can't hear it, but it's actually rather cute. It actually does a click noise at every collision. So that's kind of fun. Um, this also lets us do the famous uh, tennis ball and basketball demo. If we drop a basketball on top of a tennis ball, a lot of the energy gets put into the tennis ball, and the tennis ball will, will shoot up. And let's see that. This is very fun with the clicks. It's going <laughs> And uh, the precision of having this thing be doing things symbolically instead of uh, numerically is important here because especially in this case where they're getting uh, smushed into the wall. There's hundreds of collisions in a, a single video frame, uh, but that's not a problem uh, for the simulator. So what's good and bad about this? The good is that we now have a perfect exact simulator for this uh, kind of physics thing. You can use this to do elementary physics homeworks where the answer is, you know, square root of three plus uh, 16 ninths or something. It'll, it'll get those answers correct. Um, the bad is the length of the expressions for things like time and position can grow exponentially. Um, here's some examples on a thing where we just have three balls moving around in a square. At first, their uh, x coordinate is just this simple fraction. And then after seven collisions, it's this more complex fraction. And if you can read at the bottom, after just nine collisions, I think, it's an expression that's so long that's incredible. So um, this doesn't make for a practical uh, uh, physics engine because uh, keeping, doing this bookkeeping just gets so large. But maybe it's good enough for my billiards problem. So let's see what happens when we uh, redo the billiards now with the perfect simulator. Reverse, come together, oh darn. So it's not the butterfly effect that's causing the only problem. Something else is, uh, uh, is causing the problem too. And in this case, we can uh, try to zero in on it. Yeah? Isn't that disturbing? And that, <laughs> it would seem to me that if you're, if you're looking at a perfect, without floating point errors, without minor offsets that you have in really quite cool and things like that, your expectation is symmetry. That is correct. That is why my thread got banned from physics Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, the strike ball is completely hitting it straight on. Completely hitting it straight on. Um, to dive into that, I have chosen to show a non-symmetric example first. So let's take a look at a non-symmetric example and see what's going on. Uh, we're going to have two different seeds, because I said when there's multiple collisions at the same time, I pick a pair to uh, uh, change the velocities for first. 
So they collide. And depending on the random seed, either the two balls go out at almost the same speed or one ball zips off uh, uh, much faster. Let's see that again. Don't worry about them like looking like they're not touching. That's just a frame thing. It's ca calculating everything exactly. So why does it fail? Well, when there's three or more objects, and our formula only does two at a time, we have a question of what order do you analyze the collisions. I do what most game engines do, and they randomly pick among all the simultaneous collisions. Uh, but as you randomly pick different things, you're going to get uh, uh, different results. And on this simple uh, case with just three balls, one with a different mass, um, I'm not going to go through the physics here, but you can see it's just little fractions. If you've had first semester college physics or a year of high school physics, um, you can work this out. When the two things collide, if you do the, assume the first one, if you analyze the first one first, then well, all the momentum gets converted to the second one. Well, anyway, uh, I said I wasn't going to go into it. But it's very simple calculations that, uh, uh, that are easy to see that doing the left collision or the right collision first will give you, a, uh, will give you different answers. Um, here's a graph showing the balls, where the balls move over time after the collision. So when, when the seed is 0, uh, its time is going uh, down the y-axis here. Um, they, they move according to the, the blue dots and, and lines. So the left ball is moving uh, the fastest, and the middle ball is uh, moving slower. And the, when the, we have the other seed, we get the red trajectory, and the two balls are moving almost, uh, uh, almost together. Let's zoom in on the leftmost ball. And we can ask ourselves, uh, if we believe that what it came up with was at least physically plausible, and we can go back to the equations of the collision and see that conservation and energy and glancing velocity are all uh, uh, conserved appropriately, are these the only two solutions? Um, that work. And in fact, we can use uh, SymPy and a bit more work trying to find real solutions to complex equations and find out that actually anything, the, the leftmost ball could have ended up anywhere after five seconds along this line. And the two solutions we found, while in this case are near the extremes, they're not the extremes of uh, every possible position. So the left ball could have ended up anywhere here, which means it could have had a, a range of, uh, of velocities, all of which uh, obey Newto Newtonian uh, physics. OK, so let's look at a symmetric example now, a, simplified, a simple one. It's going straight in. I'm going to do my game thing where I just pick a collision first. So if I do that and do the one seed, you can see it's asymmetric, which is disturbing. Do the other seed. It's it goes, gets a different answer. Let's uh, superimpose those two together. And we can see them going off to different places. Um, if you believe that there's a physical law called conservation of symmetry, which there isn't, um, you would get a third solution, which is here. But OK, we've got two solutions from kind of the game engine way to do it. We've got one solution. I mean, symmetry certainly uh, obeys the other uh, laws of physics. Are these the only solutions? Well, again, using uh, Python and SymPy, we can find that there's actually, again, an infinite number of uh, solutions that obey the laws of Newtonian physics. The two object balls will be on a line segments so off at 30 degrees, plus and minus. And the uh, cue ball will be on an ellipse, an axis-aligned ellipse, a uh, segment of the axis-aligned ellipse. The reason it can't be all the way over is because then the balls would be, over, uh, the balls would be overlapping. Yes, sorry. Uh, it's, it, it is an axis-aligned ellipse in this case. Yeah. 
You may be asking questions beyond my mathematical ability to answer. I can say in, with these particular initial conditions, the velocity of the cue ball, uh, all the solutions are on an ellipse, an axis aligned ellipse. Uh, I, mean, isn't the, I don't know. What's an axis aligned ellipse with, <laughs> with respect to an algebraic curve? I don't know. Um, So this seems to teach us some things about uh, physics, that Newtonian collisions are non-deterministic, which uh, might be outrageous, uh, often with an infinite number of possible outcomes. And it's not because of precision. It's because of something to do with uh, incompleteness uh, uh, in this uh, uh, condition of this part of Newtonian physics. Uh, specifically, we saw the two-dimensional case where the balls were coming in from either side, and it depends whether we take the limit from the left side or the right side. Um, when people say, like I'd heard way back when, that Newtonian physics is reversible, that doesn't mean that there's only one path back and one path forward. What it's really saying is that of all the solutions that are possible, when you could play things backwards, one of those solutions is still possible. So if you make in terms of kind of randomness, of if all the random choices you could make, if you're really lucky, you could uh, find it going backwards, too. So did I make a new discovery in elementary physics with Python and SymPy? Well, no. Of course, this stuff is already known, if not widely known. Uh, quoting the Stanford Encyclopedia of uh, Philosophy, determinism breaking models can be constrained, can be constructed on the basis of collision phenomena the first problem is that multiple particle collisions for which Newtonian particle mechanics simply doesn't have a prescription for what happens. Uh, a paper from Berkeley professor Edward Lee, not that long ago, less than uh, 10, seven years ago, uh, who, who models physical systems. Any set of deterministic models that's rich enough to model New Newton's laws is incomplete in that the set does not include all its limit points. We'll always be faced with possible corner cases that yield non-deterministic models. And I made a second post to Reddit Physics with the 1D example and uh, Edward Lee's, which is an example from Edward Lee. Um, people were much happier with that. And uh, Professor Lee actually uh, joined in the uh, conversation at a few places. So I can conclude now. And we can open it up to questions where you can ask me things if you'd like. Uh, with Python and SymPy, we can create a perfect Newtonian physics engine. It's not generally practical because the expressions uh, get too big. I think it's really cool that we can do it at all. Um, it's useful for some homework style problems and to better understand uh, the Newtonian model, that there kind of is interesting things going here uh, in the mathematics of the Newtonian model. Uh, for future work, uh, I would the simplest thing I'd like to do would be to add uh, units, so we actually know that these are kilograms or, or, or pounds or whatever. Uh, a more ambitious thing that I probably won't do but would be fun would be to see if I can find, always find the full infinite solutions and then uh, project them forward. Uh, resources, either to play with this or you just want to see some examples of uh, using SymPy. Everything is on uh, GitHub. Also on GitHub, as of yesterday or the day before, there is a live demo because uh, PyScript will run SymPy. And I was able to port everything into PyScript. So you can just bring up a web page and run all these simulations. And you can change the Python code on the web page and hit Enter and see how it uh, uh, changes things. And there's also a four-part article that goes into uh, all of this uh, on the online uh, medium uh, uh, journal or uh, magazine towards data science that, uh, that you can look up. Questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. The question is, is the non-determinism a feature of the model or reality? And I'd say yes. 
it's a feature of Newtonian physics. And you can say, well, you had a very simplified model. What if you put in uh, springs? Uh, then, they, then it would be deterministic if, if balls were springy instead. But how are you going to set your exact spring constant? It would be super, super sensitive to that. It's unlikely that you could set it to actually model uh, the real balls perfectly. Um, what? Okay. Well, okay. This is a point that uh, Professor Lee makes. If we want to talk about what's really real, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that we cannot know the velocity and position of a ball to, with infinite precision, because quantum mechanics makes that non-deterministic. What's that? Oh, I would like to do the 2D experiment for real. Um, I haven't gotten it set up yet. Yeah, I, I believe, I mean, we, in a sense, every time somebody plays pool, they're, they're doing this. They might have attributed the randomness you get from a pool break to the fact that we don't, the balls aren't always put in exactly the same position, and you don't, even if you want to, you don't strike uh, head on. I believe that's not the case. My personal belief is there's also randomness. Uh, a, big sort of the, a big source of the randomness from a pool break is the non-determinism of, of these collisions, that there's, yeah. Uh, I, I can only tell you, I haven't proven that, so I can't say that. And under the Newtonian model, a pool break is non-deterministic, even if all the balls are done uh, perfectly and everything is symmetric. That I can say. Yes? Does this relate to the three-body problem in physics, the indeterminism of the three-body problem? No, but it's very confusing, because this is three collisions. Uh, the, th uh, the question is, how does this relate to the three-body problem in physics? That says when you have three um, masses in a gravitational, in mutual gravitation, um, it's very uh, analytically difficult to predict their trajectory. Um, I don't know that it's actually non-deterministic. It's just really, really hard. Um, I but think it's subject to the infinite uh, it does. It certainly has a very big butterfly effect. So the main reason it's confusing is because when you go to look up three balls colliding, you're going to get things about three um, satellites uh, uh, orbiting each other. So it makes it hard to <laughs> it makes it hard to learn about this because of uh, the naming uh, similarity. And of course, three is always more complicated than two in physics, and in that in that they have that in common. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so have the balls so they're not exactly touching? Correct. I believe you are correct. And actually, uh, one of my friends who's here in the audience also suggested that. Um, so the suggestion is, what if the balls in the, in the pool brink weren't actually touching? What if we just moved them apart just a little bit? Um, would that make it so I could reverse everything? I think it would, except I can't do the experiment even on the computer. Uh, and the reason is, when, well, I, maybe I could. Um, when you separate them a little bit, um, you usually won't get any, multi, any collisions of more than two things at a time going forward. And because of that, when you reverse time, there's only one way for things to come back, and things will reverse. But even when I moved them a smidgen and it was just like uh, three one hundredths up and down and so kind of nice simple numbers, the expressions grew so fast um, that I couldn't run it for more than a few collisions. And with 10 balls plus the cue ball, uh, I just kind of like, oh, this is going to take you know, an ex twice as much time each time, and it's going to take longer than the uh, time of the universe to do 10 balls. I could probably do three balls, though, and I just haven't done it. And just like I'm uh, maybe implicitly saying, who cares about symmetry because most things in the world aren't symmetric? symmetric. Um, 
you could also argue who cares about things touching because most things in the world aren't literally uh, aren't literally touching, and and that would be fair. Any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, so not banned, just the thread was taken down as being too controversial. Um, I did the symmetric pool thing, and people were outraged that I didn't see that, that the symmetric solution was the obvious correct uh, solution. And after 100 comments, that got taken down. Uh, the one where everything was on 2D and started out asymmetric got 60 upvotes, and everybody was, was happy. So I can still post to Reddit, although I'm now being very careful about what I say and how I say it. Okay, thank you.